Greetings again in Jesus' name. You know, I've spoken on many subjects in my lessons over the years. We were the ones that uncovered what they really believe out there about stopping sin. Even sins as heinous as molestation and domestic abuse and incest, you name it, there's not a single sin that you can mention to these people that they say absolutely has to stop before a person can be granted salvation from Christ or forgiveness and filled with the Spirit. They have everybody not only saved in sin, but saved in the very act of sin. And that's what I want to talk about today. You know, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, as they call it, in Matthew 6, 23 and 24, but if the eye is bad, then the whole body is full of darkness. If therefore the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? See, on the other hand, if the eye is good, the whole body's full of light. But if the eye is bad, the whole body's full of darkness. So if therefore the light in you is darkness, that you claim is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And as we focus in on what we're going to talk about, a very trying and difficult subject, to even talk about it with any kind of decorum, but it has to be brought out. We can't just put our head in the sand and forget these things are happening and ignore the many people that are the victims of this type of abuse that's going on right under the noses of the church. It has to be called out. And I feel that's what I have to do. So bear with me. I'm not the greatest speaker in the world. This is real life here. I just turn the camera on and I start talking. So bear with me if I don't always look at the camera that I look at my text. I feel it's necessary to bring these things out about the facade that's in the church, the professed church, and the result that has happened to the people. See, they're in great darkness that they believe to be light. They say that they see, and they give the magic cloak and the magic words and the magic covers and all the other stuff. We see. But what do they see? See, they profess to know God, but in works deny Him, being abominable and disobedient and disqualified for every good work, every righteous and holy work, in righteous judgment especially. See, there's nothing that is pure to them. Everything's filthy rags. Like the undercurrent of everything is pure filth, filth filled with excuses and lies and hypocrisy, supported by the pastors and the church elders. They say they see. But if you were blind, then you'd have no sin. But you say you see, therefore your sin remains, Jesus says. Well, your sin remains, that's for sure. But the main focus, what's the main focus of evangelical Christianity today? It's surely not purging this type of sin out from among them, or living pure before God, a conscience clear before God and man. No. No, what happens? Well, it's based on a message that he did it all for you. He took your place. You receive that by taking a trip to the altar and repeating some magical prayer and a public confession that you now believe in Jesus. And pretty much then after you join the church, then you get baptized or rebaptized in many cases. You become a member of a brick and mortar church, usually incorporated in the 501 charitable organization. Most of them are. Then most of the people, they sign up for as many of the church committees uh, groups and committees and organizations, the activities that they, their schedule can bear. So they can be a good supporter and tither of the church. And then they're brought into the collective consciousness of evangelical conservative Christianity that wraps itself in the flag and create, equates God with country in just war and pro-military in this fanatical support of Israel, the nation of Israel, no matter what they do or how obvious their fraud and duplicity is. See, many of them, they'll march against abortion, and they'll speak out against gay marriage, and they'll stand for the Ten Commandments, and they'll be in favor of school, uh, Christian schooling and all the rest of it. And they'll even conduct purity balls for their daughters. And they'll have these little ceremonies where they wear all white, and they, they have this big ceremony and all the tears and everything. I've seen these things when I was in Africa. And they make these pledges and take these vows and wear this ring for their father that they're going to remain pure until their marriage. So they listen to Christian radio, TV, all the latest Christian movies, all the people like Kirk Cameron and Ray Comfort out there, all those liars. 
Then they Christianize their sports idolatry and their various vain amusements and their conduct. Everything in the name of Jesus. Their rummage sales, their dinners, their clubs, their field trips. You name it. It's all done in the name of Jesus. While all this is happening, under their very noses is an undertow of pure filth. That's the only thing I can really call it, to be honest with you. That's taking place in the shadows. It's kept suppressed. Some of it sometimes bursts out when these people commit wrongdoings that are against the law and they get arrested. But it can only be described as the depths of Satan, like paraphrased about the church of Thyatira that excelled in works, love, and service. And I paraphrase that, which is why you abound in charity and love and service, you excel in immorality and uncleanness beyond imagination, beyond anyone's imagination. Truly, we should declare a state of emergency as I did years ago, those series of videos that I don't think are any longer on my channel for various reasons. When we talked about sending out those questions to the pastors as a child molester had to stop molesting children to be saved, and we got back all those huge pile of answers, all from all over the United States and the world, in fact, that insisted that, no, they don't have to, that somehow they were magically going to get saved while they were in the very act of sin, and Jesus was going to change him later. We should be, we should be try, shouting this stuff from the rooftops, folks, because we need a repentance in our midst on the scale of Nineveh and beyond. But yet the system will not even recognize this dilemma that they've brought it upon themselves. They put web pages up to, expo to talk about these things and look at solutions and give all the uh, learned opinions of, of these uh, Christian counselors, these so-called senior Christian counselors, to try to solve these problems. But yet they don't even realize that what they preach, this facade of receiving Jesus and joining the church and all this facade and God appearance of godliness, that underneath this filth and excuse of this sin nature nonsense defiles everything that they do. I thought I'd bring out again this uh, classic example of a response that we received to the question, does a child molester have to stop doing that in order to be saved? Well, a summary answer from this one senior pastor was they thanked us for the inquiry, and then first they're going to tell you that the Bible supports the idea that a person doesn't really have to do anything to get saved. Because we're not saved by what we do, we're saved by what Jesus Christ has already done. What have I been saying in all my videos? That's what they preach, okay? When they say Jesus paid it all, he did it all, receive his righteousness, that's what they mean, okay? See, there's no code here. They just come right out and said it. You're saved by not what you do. No, not forsaking sin, not coming clean with God, not emptying your heart of guile. No, you're saved by what's already been done for you. So you're saved in the very act of your vile acts. Your dispositions don't ever have to change. Just repeat Romans 10, 9, and 10, right? It says, so we believe in our heart that you just confess Jesus Christ by your mouth and you're saved. But she goes on to say, and she says, people get saved and still smoke and curse and lie and steal and have drug, drug problems and even sexual addictions. That's the question that we ask. And they commit adultery and all the other things. So we, through an ongoing relationship with Jesus Christ, we can eventually work this sin out of their lives. You see what I mean? You come in, saved in the very act, it's going to be worked out of your life. See, these people supposedly have Christ, as I've said before, but yet they still can't overcome their lust. Because they've never plucked out the evil eye of their flesh and cast it from them in repentance. They've never crucified the flesh with its passions and desires in the act of repentance because it's not necessary. Jesus did it all for you. So this is the view that they have. The Holy Spirit's going to help them. Sadly, though, and more tragically, people do get saved and continue in this heinous activity of child molestation. Did you hear that? I bolded it out. I put this document on my website when I'm done with this. Did you see that? That should make you cry. They get saved and continue in the very act of harming little children. Now, I don't want to get too worked up with this. I try to keep a lid on it. 
says, I know people that read the word and they pray and they go to church and they sing the loudest and all these faithful things, but they never change for some reason. And then she goes on to say, well, she doubts maybe the person was never saved to begin with. So, you know, casting a doubt on their self. They always do this. Where on the other side of their mind,